Oh, well, I just quickly pray to the Lord that this would go well. So hopefully it will. Well, amen. I trust him. Mercy, Lord. Well, all right. Well, this is, uh, this is something I've really wanted to talk about for a long time. I've been, ever since I've been handed the keys to the former, you know, this channel going on right here, the former Identity Gospel Ministries channel. Now it is Correcting Identity Teachers University. I've really encountered quite a few people who are in this identity movement. And beyond any shadow of a reasonable doubt, I've seen how brainwashed they are. I've seen the demons that are literally living inside of them and the demon manifest saying, you're taking them out of context. You're not showing love. And I see the evil spirits behind people who come against the truth of Jesus Christ. And I really just want to flat out state that it is absolutely crazy the way these people have been brainwashed. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> you're funny, man. You're funny, Tristan. Well, this is, uh, by the way, for people who don't know, we're making a reference to uh, the video from SoCar uh, where Jay Meezy was agreeing with Pete Cabrera. <laughs> I'll cut that part out. Don't worry. I don't feel it. I, I'm all blasting. He's being cool. So I'll, I'll leave that out. <laughs> but, um, but absolutely, bro. Well, this is, this is a good friend of mine. His name is Brother Tris. His name is Tristan. And I'll let him introduce himself and then we'll get started on what this is going to be about. But to give you a little short overview, we're going to be speaking about the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about the Pharisees. And this is a really important lesson for people in the identity movement to learn because of the fact that these people are the real Pharisees of Christianity, and they're not even really in Christianity, most of them at least. And what we have to understand is them going on the offensive, but making it look like they're on the defense is one of the most deceptive things that I've ever seen from these people. And this is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees knew exactly what they were doing. I believe these people know what they're doing. I think they know they're walking in a false love. They're walking in a false spirit and they're absolutely evil people who need to repent, but we love them. So we're going to shed some light on the truth today, but I'll let brother Tristan introduce himself first. Hi, I'm an evil person as well. Can I just say that? Um, in a different but way. I'm trying way. to repent. I'm we have trying to follow the Lord. We're I, for accidental sin. Exactly. Look, there is no one good, not even one, right? Um, yeah, I feel the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here, Father. And we want to glorify your Son. Please help us to express how we feel about what's going on with this particular thing, right? Uh, my name's Tristan. I've known John for, well, o at least over a year now. We've met in real life, right? Mm -hmm, we yeah. first met at, B at a BDS conference. So we're real friends. <laughs> we are. It's not just like a, a cyber virtual thing. We are actually like brethren who have been in each other's presence, enjoyed each other's conversation and company, right? That's right. So it is because it, actually there is like there are facades that people hold behind a screen, you know, and so until you've actually met someone for real, you don't really know what that person's like. They could be the sweetest person, and on on camera, on the internet, they're horrible, <laughs> or they seem horrible, right? Oh, I've ran into person, that before, my friend. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. So. Um, yeah, we're actually truly, truly friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm honored to, you know, be able to chat with you. It's been a while, hasn't it? So, so yeah, I, I, I we were talking over Facebook about this particular we were. thing. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, yeah, yeah. Me and Tristan were talking. Um, and I really was like asking him, like, who do you think the real Pharisees are? Because we see this term thrown around so much in Christianity, like, oh, these people are the Pharisees, you're acting like a Pharisee, all that stuff. And I, I'm really just wondering, like, okay, there was a distinct, because we, you know, Tristan and I both know the truth about the way that demons operate and know that Christians need deliverance. And we understand there was like a specific demonic entity that was the head principality of the doctrine that the Pharisees had, the way they acted, and really everything that was embedding their soul. So we have to really think about it like, okay, what was that demon like? What was its doctrine? What, how did it operate? Because you can 
like paint with a really broad brush stroke and say like 10 to 12 different types of people are Pharisees. But at the end of the day, there is a specific type of individual that is literally walking in the Pharisee spirit, that is literally walking with that head demonic principality as their Lord and their God. And that's a really scary thing to delve into. It's absolutely true. So we started talking about that and Tristan was shedding some great light on it. So I, I feel led to let him come in right now. But, um, you know, we, we can start getting into that a little bit and interweave like kind of the Facebook conversation in too. Absolutely. Let's just discuss it between us. I mean, sure. I would say, you know, like the, 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 there's a, a misconception, uh, especially with people like us. We're always accused of work salvation, right? And so people will accuse us of being Pharisees for that reason. That's fair, isn't it? Yep. So, like, but for me, like, every, everything like that is spiritual. Like, what the spirit behind the Pharisees is what's important. What was that spirit? Well, look, everybody struggles with pride to some degree, mm -hmm. right? But the Pharisees, like, characterized pride. You know, they, they, they literally stereotyped it. Mm -hmm. Like, there, there wasn't any, anyone who stereotyped the, the spirit of pride and arrogance and snobbiness more than them. They thought they were better than everybody else because they tithed or whatever. They thought that they were, they wanted to sit in the highest like valued seats in the synagogue. They wanted to be seen to make long prayers in front of everybody and give massive donations to the temple and blah, blah, blah. Right. Because they wanted to be seen to do like, works of holiness actually work they wanted to be seen as like righteous people right Absolutely. And, uh, as opposed to actually like in fear and trembling working out your salvation and like you know knowing your place under the lord knowing that you know this is this is a fight to the end we have to endure we have to like humble ourselves uh, even today I got it so, so wrong. I had to apologize to someone because my attitude was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, in that moment, perhaps I was a Pharisee. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That spirit of Phariseeism attacks anyone at any given time. It's not like something that is like a a perpetual thing unless you're in total agreement yeah. with that spirit. Yeah, yeah, depending on if you've really bought into it. And that is really, I guess, what it means in the Bible and John when it says that Jesus didn't entrust himself to men because he knew what was in men. And it says that he knew what was in all men. So it's like, that is the ability for their flesh to be taken over and influenced by a demon for them to walk in that kind of situation. But yes, that is a good delineation to make. Like it could happen to anyone. Absolutely. And it does happen to everyone at times. I definitely believe. And then there are the people who are perpetually walking in it. But then there's a reason why the tax collector couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. Mm -hmm. He knew he was like that. The Pharisee didn't. That's a really good point. We, like that. You yeah. see what I'm trying <laughs> to say, right? <laughs> That's really good. So, he, you know, if you actually know you're like that, how can you lift your eyes to heaven with any kind of like pride or arrogance? Do you know what I'm saying? It's not that it doesn't hit you. It's not that you're not attacked by it. It's not that you don't sometimes give into it accidentally, yeah. but then you repent when you find out you're forgiven 70 times seven, etc. But the thing is, the Pharisee saw nothing wrong with it. Oh, Father, thank you that I am a son. Thank you that I have, I have been made, you know, pure and perfect and holy and righteous exactly. just because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Now Listen, right you've actually got to try and realize, look, the spirit is born again, the flesh isn't, and we have to deny it. You, and the, you know what's really you know what's really interesting about that i want to add real quick like when people even quote verses from the bible and they're saying things that were written inspired by the holy spirit they'll be saying them but it's but it's out of this weird pride like when dan moeller for example will say thank you that i've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and all that and it's like it's all just in this wrong way like he's not overall a true preacher at all but he's like trying to say things that are true but the thing is, is that a lot of these Pharisees, they'll be, hey, I'll bet the Pharisees were quoting the Bible all the time, quoting the Old Testament constantly. Surely. And they could say, oh, Jesus quoted the Old Testament when he was being tempted by the devil. I'm quoting the Old Testament here. Look, 
we're both doing the same thing, but they're doing it from two completely different perspectives. Jesus is doing it in the Holy Spirit, and these Pharisees are just absolutely in their flesh. Well, the, the characteristic that marks God more than anything else, obviously, is holiness. But what comes with holiness is humility. God loves humility, right? You can say, you can say the same scripture as someone else and say it with utter pride. You know what I mean? You can use that scripture to, to bolster your self-ego, basically. Or you can do it in the, in the way that the Lord Jesus Christ did it. And in utter humility, just explain the truth. This is how it is. There's no glory here. There's no, you know, I'm not trying to glorify myself. If anyone's going to glorify me, it's the Father, you know. But at the end of the day, like, when you're using the Bible basically to, I don't know, boost your ego or something and, and make yourself appear to be more righteous or mo more holy or whatever than everybody else uh, so that they come to your level or something, you just got it backwards. Like, all, for me, like, the, the most powerful preaching is when the person preaching is totally real with their weaknesses and faults because it's in weakness that God's strength can shine exactly. through. And that's where the humility comes in. You've got to actually understand, no, really, we really don't deserve eternal life. None of us. None of us deserve it. We all deserve damnation. Exactly. If, you, if you're looking with eyes, with haughty eyes, saying, I'm a son, I'm a, you know, I'm basically like, I'm there already. There's nothing I've got to do except just believe and blah, blah, blah. You're just like totally deluded. In my you know what's opinion. interesting is, and I want to get back right to what you were saying in just a second. So we're going to link back to it, Lord willing. But James 3, 2, I don't have it in front of me, but like the paraphrase is like, we all stumble in many ways. And then later in James, it says, um, every beast has been tamed but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless tongue. evil full of deadly poison. When do you see people like Dan Muller and Todd White getting up and really being like, yeah, guys, you know what? Sometimes my tongue slips and I'm really sorry. And like, it happens. And they, they tell about their experiences and they're like, I'm sorry, this has happened. I'm working on it. When do you see a real authentic situation coming out of men like that? You really just see them say, and, they, and they'll, they'll phrase it like, oh, you know, if we talk about sin, you know, we'll be sin conscious and then we'll just commit it. But it's like, if you're ignoring the sin that's in your life and you never talk about it at all, you're covering it up unrighteously and you're not confessing and forsaking it. And that's a big problem that I see too. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know their work that well because to be honest with you, to watch them just frustrates me and it always has done. Mm -hmm. uh, I do try to give it time just you know, I, I like to, I want everybody to be saved. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I know there are other people who disagree, who just say, don't worry about it. You know, God's just going to sort it out. Seriously, I, I'm, I just want to do my best to do, do what I can to help everybody find the truth and, you know, humbly receive salvation um, on God's terms, not on their yeah. terms, though, right? Yeah. But... At the same time, we judge a tree by its fruit, right? Absolutely. As what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And so when I see those guys, I do not see the fruit of humility more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like a, it happens in the Church of England as well. Oh, wow. You know, people generally just kind of like, as a corporate, you know, body in the, in the church will say, have mercy on us. We, we've sinned, Father, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no. Look, you've just got to get specific here. You've got to confess among the brothers. If you really have sinned, you better tell every, you better tell someone you trust. Yeah. And yeah. also like confess it so that you can be forgiven. And, and whatever it is, you know, if you're really, really struggling, you need deliverance. You need yeah. you need to go deep in prayer. You might need to fast. Because it's serious. It's really serious. Yeah, yeah. isn't it interesting about how Jesus taught people how to pray? He's like Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He's telling you, like, they're like, how do we pray? Not like, how do we pray one time to get salvation or whatever. They're like, how do we pray? In general, right. after, we're, after we're initially saved, when we're walking in repentance, he's like, you want to know how to pray after you're walking in repentance? Forgive me of my sins. And hey, pray this way every single day. That's the thing. Right. There's bad thoughts running through your mind and stuff you got to take captive. 
every single day of your life. And there are those yeah. times where the demons will come in and do that. And people who are ignorant to that, they try to ignore it. And this is why we see the identity movement saying, don't be sin conscience. They're saying, ignore the battle. They're not saying fight the battle. They're saying, ignore it. That's no good. Well, well, look, the, the, the next line after that is lead us not into temptation. Mm -hmm. So the Lord, it, the Lord is examining us at any given moment, mm -hmm. all of us. Why? Because we are not made perfect yet. And also we have to endure to the end to be saved right? Lead us not into temptation means he will hand you over to Satan until you learn. Yeah. To, until you learn why you're in agreement with him and what's attacking you so that then you can overcome it and then get deeper into holiness with him. Exactly. That's the process of sanctification, right? You are not already made holy. You are being made holy, right? It's a, it's a con continuous present tense right you are continually walking until you die this road of sanctification right so the point is lead us not into temptation as in please don't hand us over the to the devil until we actually learn our lesson but deliver us from the evil one deliverance is the children's bread deliverance means that if i'm actually truly understanding how i'm being attacked i'm being real with how i'm like being attacked and what i'm giving into and the things i agree with that are dark then i can then start to fight it if you don't actually even recognize the darkness in you how are you ever going to fight it exactly so, and, and there are a few verses that i want to mention on that note for the people who are in this movement who don't presume that we still have wickedness in us I mean, I already named we all stumble in many ways. No man can tame the tongue. Speaking of the general condition of mankind in an audience speaking to Christians, by the way. But there are verses like 2 Corinthians 7, 1, which say, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And then 2 Peter 3, 14, for the people who say don't be sin conscience. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So with that in mind, a lot of these people don't think they have to be diligent to be found spotless and blameless. They think it's an unconditional thing they get when they initially enter into the kingdom of God, if they even got born again, which I don't believe a lot of them have, unfortunately. But these verses speak the truth about the matter, that you can get defiled, so you need to be diligent to be found spotless and blameless saying you've got to continue the race and finish it and there's actually one more that i want to uh, put up there okay. real quick um it is hebrews 12 1 wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us so someone who's completely perfect that verse makes no sense it makes no sense Ooh. at all no. Well, look, let's rein this back in to the original topic, which was the Pharisee or the Pharisee spirit, right? Yes, let's do it. What, 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 what exemplified uh, the Pharisee above all was, so if you actually look at that scripture, I haven't got it before me, but oh, if you actually look at that scripture, if I remember rightly, he basically says, thank you that I'm not like that guy. Thank you that you made me like this. Thank you that I have everything, blah, blah, blah. And thank you that like I'm he was taking Christ. pride in his <laughs> pride in his heritage, pride in his situation, pride over other people because that guy's a piece of garbage, blah, blah, blah. Right. This is the, this is what exemplifies the Pharisee spirit. Like, you know, and also the jealousy aspect, like there's a, there's a kind of like, um, a competitiveness mm -hmm. i'm more holy than you Big jesus time. jesus you come on the scene you start doing miracles and doing amazing things hang on a minute you're going to take our glory here we need to kill you that's their attitude right oh really you're going to come on here and start healing lepers on a sabbath who do you think you are, are you the lord of the sabbath we don't think so that's their attitude right any how anybody can sit there and watch a leper hand be healed regardless of what day it is and not be so amazed that you actually submit to that person and go that's the finger of god you truly must be a prophet how anybody can go actually like think 
this person's going to take our glory. We better kill him. How anybody can think that, but that's the Pharisee spirit. They are in agreement with that spirit. So in the same way that Jezebel exemplified that particular spirit, right? Painting her face, usurping the husband or king, whatever. Running your uh, you know, puppet master. Killing the prophets. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Like when she was basically puppet mastering Ahab, taking out any opposition. That Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but so in the same way that Jezebel's spirit uh, was exemplified by that particular person who had that incomplete agreement, so do the Pharisee, uh, people who have that Pharisee spirit, they exemplify what the Pharisees were in that day. That's why we call it like that. It's, it's just easy to spot because of that. But because there's a complete misconception about what that is, actually, even if you mention the fact that you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling you have to obey the lord you have to you know basically what they call work salvation all of a sudden it's like we're the pharisees just yeah. because we want to keep the law no we're not talking about keeping the law of moses we're talking about the law of the spirit exactly for the, for those you know for there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus who walk not by the flesh but by the spirit for the law of the spirit of life there's a law of the spirit of life right there is a law you have to keep that law right mm -hmm. of the spirit mm -hmm. not the spirit of sin and death yeah it says in james 2 so speak and so act as those who will be judged by i believe it says the law of liberty uh because judgment will be merciless to the one who doesn't show mercy so right. absolutely there's this law that we're still under we basically go from one law to another not being under the old covenant but being in the new now definitely right but it, it's kind of transcended from that as well in the sense that so obviously people especially the identity teachers will talk about love right all the time now all, all the time but the thing is what does love really look like love isn't some kind of like fuzzy dozzy hazy feeling or something love looks like sacrifice it looks like blood sweat and tears it looks like what well, it's it's picturized it's visualized at the cross that's what love looks like mm -hmm. right but you know it's not just like i'm going to i'm i'm just going to hug you until you cry or something you know it, it's like it could be that in the right circumstance yeah. i'm not saying it isn't but basically that's not all it is it's not like a feeling it's not like a Love isn't like a something I receive. Something is something I give, right? It's more blessed to give than to receive, right? So it, the, the point I'm trying to make here is the Pharisee spirit never involved that kind of sacrificial giving. It's all about building your own kingdom. It's all about yourself. I need to keep the law in order that God will see me as righteous, right? those who accuse us of work salvation um have totally like misread what's actually going on just because the lord tells you to do something doesn't mean you have a choice to do it do you see what i'm trying to say if he tells you to do something well if he's really your lord why do you call me call me lord lord and not do what i say exactly, exactly. You, you see what i'm saying so if he's telling you to do something you have to like deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me or you're not worthy of me you have to give me your wife your your children whatever or you are not worthy of me there's a whole bunch of things you have to count the cost oh, what is the cost well you might die doing this right so that you know there, there's a whole bunch of things that can that, that that are kind of um a package of what it means to be a disciple but the pharisee spirit as far as i can tell it as it's evolved to the modern day is um the pharisees basically um there's no obviously we've we've said there's no giving really it's all about getting it's all about their own kingdom you know you know if this man carries on all of israel will believe in him they won't believe in us you know what i mean it's that spirit right but also it's like i don't know that pride in your righteousness in your own ability to overcome never like admitting you have weaknesses never humbling yourself and saying 
do you know what guys i've done it again i'm so so you know I, I i just can't believe how wretched how filthy i am like people who get closer to holiness in my opinion see that their, their, their sin on a way deeper level than That's you can't even true. see sin until you go deeper with holiness the closer you get to holiness the more aware of sin you are not the less totally especially 100%. within yourself mm -hmm. especially within yourself right so therefore what does it mean like when you work out your salvation with fear and trembling as you walk that sanctification process what the lord's actually doing is okay you want to walk this far i'm going to show you a little bit more this is the darkness i don't like in you are you going to change are you going to obey me okay you overcame that bit let's go a bit deeper let's go a bit deeper now you overcame that bit and now you're ready and for kill. this and this is might even surprise you how deep this rabbit hole goes because people oftentimes when they're in a false movement like the identity situation they underestimate their own sin they're like oh it ain't that bad and it's actually terrible and well, that's even everyone, worse. So that's it, everyone though honestly well the th the, okay so the thing is the lord chastises those he loves why because to chastise to scourge to literally beat out the yeah. evil is to be disciplined if you love someone you discipline them why because an open rebuke is better than hidden love the the whole reason we go deep with the lord the whole reason we walk this thing when we feel the chastisement of the lord when we know that he's angry with something it's not a cause just to throw up our arms in like despair it's like Oh, rats. Uh, I've done it again. And he, he, he's, he's basically showing me now, am I actually going to change? Yeah. That's basically what it means. And it might take you your whole life to overcome that. I don't even know. 70 times seven is the mercy of God. It's the and, mercy of God. Yeah. You really struggle with something, right? And the, the other thing I was thinking of too, is like when it talks about, uh, because this really is something that I think a lot of Pharisees try to hijack this passage, but they don't realize it actually turns back on them is that Matthew seven, like don't judge lest you be judged. It's like, they're telling you, you're, you should look at your brothers. It's not saying in one situation, your brother's got a speck and you have a log. It's telling you your permanent perspective needs to be that their sin is as a speck to you. And your sin, regardless of how big or small it is, is to be as a log to you. That is right. the situation. There are no exceptions. And when you see it like that, you're go you're not gonna be walking around saying you're perfected. You're not gonna be walking around saying you're good to go. It's just not how well, it I, I, I wrote I, I think this sums up the Pharisee spirit. I will just paraphrase what I said. I put up a Facebook post like over a year ago, I think. Oh, uh, it was something like it's easy to be indignant over the sins of others when you've forgotten your own that's that's true man you know what i mean like, yeah. like, all the time i see people on facebook like having a go at like homosexual people having a go at like whatever oh, like boy, being this disgusted bad. with this i'm not saying it's not bad but at the end of the day have you read romans 2 recently have you Thank right you. because <laughs> romans literally exactly right at the end of romans 1 it's like these people are this they're backbiters they're murderers they're blah 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 romans 2 and such were all of you right? yeah <laughs> you know what I mean? it's like ah oh, rats okay for the people who use none of us different. have a leg to stand on for Sorry. the people who say like oh no you're good man for the people who say first corinthians 6 they give the list of sins and say these people won't inherit the kingdom of god and such were some of you romans 2 is literally talking to true believers and it says this is a lot of you you need to repent absolutely and that that's totally true who are the foolish virgins? They are also believers. Yeah. They absolutely. come to the door, they say, Lord, Lord. They have to go and buy like extra oil because they missed the boat, right? Yeah. The point is, like, both the wise virgins and the foolish virgins are believers. It's not, it's not like a, a case of these are the unbelievers and this is the believers. No. And they all had to buy more oil, basically. And that shows that you're not literally perfected yet. So the situation is the ones who are willing to buy more oil stay saved and the ones who don't go to hell. So I want to ask you, what is buying more oil at the end of the day? And does the identity movement lack it? 
Well, I mean, buying more oil, I mean, it's, I mean, there's lots of different interpretations. I think my personal interpretation, although I've heard several that I agree with. There actually. are probably a few that are pretty decent, honestly. Yeah. They're all kind well, of- I, 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 The way I read it is spirit. Go and buy more oil. Like, you, where, where's the spirit? You know, like, there's, I, I, there's a, a verse in Ecclesiastes that I quite like, uh, hmm. which could be mis totally misinterpreted, but I know what it means. It basically, the, like to paraphrase it, it basically says, don't be too good and don't be too evil. Yeah, right? I know what you're talking right? about. So there, there's this, if you are too good, that emphasis, you, you have pride in your goodness, right? You, you, you're so good that you will never do anything wrong. There's literally nothing you can do that's wrong. Every word out of your mouth is perfect, right? But then don't be too evil because at the end of the day, that's obvious right so th there's this like but i think it what it really is referring to is like an attitude don't be too good as in you know like at the end of the day i don't know i i think i said like possibly a vague swear word earlier and i kind of thought to myself it's not it's not a swear word but it perfectly ex it, it, it summed up what it i might wanted as to well say to be. my brother right? it might well be it might well be it <laughs> might well be but at the end of the day That's there nice. is grace if the lord wants me to apologize for it i will do it right now if he asked me to right Ooh. but the thing is like it was appropriate for that particular moment right and like another christian might look at me and go who is this heretic who is this who is who is this foul spoken like man or whatever look at the end of the day you've got to just kind of understand we are all under attack at all times if you are really a christian a born-again christian the demons never rest yeah nor inside you nor outside of you they know their time is short the devil's come down he's raging they never rest day or night to try and trip you up to sin, right? Now, the thing is, I think one of the most amazing things about God's love is that he is so incredibly merciful that when we do slip up, like I did earlier, and maybe it was a swearer, I don't even know, but it's wow. the first time I've said it probably in 10 years. Wow. So probably <laughs> it is, right? But the thing is, like, his mercy is so great. If I ask him, he will forgive me. If I really feel it's a sin, or, or he shows me it's a sin, surely there's an element of darkness. We are all corrupt, right? Mm -hmm. But to rein it back into the Pharisee thing, like, they're untouchable. There's nothing they can say, nothing they can do that's wrong. The sinless perfectionist, I never sin. It's that attitude that is just literally like, no, look, you can be blameless, you can be blameless in the sense that the Lord is continually watching over you, smiling over you. Blameless means you're you not hopefully doing wrong. When it says like someone like a bishop's to be blameless or they were walking in all the statutes and commandments of the Lord, like John the Baptist's parents, that means they weren't willfully committing sin. Like their will was to righteousness. And that yeah. is possible. And that's what we have to walk in for sure. But that's a yeah. Well, the thing is, if you have, if you, if you have a relationship with the father, you know his chastisement. Absolutely. As soon as you as soon as you say something or do something that's wrong, he will chastise you if you've asked him to, right? Really? And if you're sensitive to his spirit, and then you repent. That's what you, it is. That's when you repent. It's not something that you repentance isn't something that you twist God's arm with in order for you to kind of like repentance really is like a response to his chastising. Yeah, it really that's is. That's what it is, right? It is. It, he, he, he says, no, I don't like that. That offends me. That's dark. That's wickedness. You're agreeing with demons. Why are you doing that? Are you going to say sorry, son? You know what I mean? Exactly. That's what it means to be a son of God, right? I, I really want to get into this whole perspective of the way that a lot of the people that are walking in a Pharisee spirit, they see uh, conviction, They'll be very quick to call it um, conviction and not condemnation, but yeah. it feels like condemnation sometimes when God really is chastising you. Like they never have like a frown on their face when they're talking about conviction, but the word chastise in archaic terms, which is, you know, in the times of the Bible and even after that was to beat someone with a whip. So, right. I mean, all these identity people, 
I guess they're just smiling as they're being beaten with a whip, but it really shows their fake character. I've definitely had times in my Christian walk where I was just really upset at myself because of things that I did, like not even like willful sin, like things that I didn't even really realize I was getting into. But then after the fact, God is beating me spiritually and showing me I'm very disappointed in you and I'm angry at what you did. And there are times where you definitely repent in tears. And I just really, I, when I don't, I don't know if you, someone that's scary, man. I don't know if you caught that live stream I did like, I don't know, four weeks ago, five weeks ago. I don't know if I did. I'm not sure. Um, well, the, 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 the reason I mentioned it was basically I had this conversation with someone about a subject that's controversial. He, like it escalated. We exchanged like hot words he's a brother i i basically like because i have this spirit of offense that attacks me often and that is my main stronghold by the way i'll admit it on camera right now i get way too offended way too quick right and and it it, it what it turns into is mo moody gloomy attacking i'm going to like cut you with my tongue kind of attack back right it's just something i'm trying to deal with the lord knows but anyway this went too far the chastisement i felt from the lord was so heavy i mean if i didn't know better you could definitely take that as like wrath of the damned oh that's how that's how that's how heavy it is on me For right people who have and i i love what you just said and i really want to um i really want to talk about it for just a second for people who have never, if you're watching this and you've never really felt like condemned when you were getting chastised by God, I question if you've ever been chastised by God. I just want to say that. I agree. Totally. Because the, th the thing is, look, when your dad, I, I mean, I never had an earthly dad uh, until like my mother remarried mm -hmm. and he did get really angry with me mm -hmm. like that, but it was different because it was, he wasn't like my, you know, it, like we evolved yeah, I, I would like, imagine that deeper. Well, we evolved that deep relationship, but it wasn't like an earthly father thing. So I, I'm trying to relate, if you know what I mean. But like, just from the relationship with my heavenly father, which is so in, so intimate, so much more intimate than anything else, right? Anyone else, like that, you know, like when your dad basically gets so angry with you, you know it's out of love, but he's so upset that you would like basically do something so wicked, right? Yeah. or so like stupid or whatever it is right that obviously he's going to be completely mad with you oh yeah okay. and it's not like abuse it's like this needs to be dealt with yeah. otherwise you're going to be if i don't deal with this like with my full force of discipline you'll probably do it again it's kind of like if you see it if you see like cancerous cells growing you're like we need to cut this out or it's gonna kill you and everyone right. has to be going through that in their Christian walk, understanding that for the people who don't, they're having those cancerous things build up in their life, but they say there are some that are already perfected and then the cancer is building up and then they're having more uh, condemnation. They're having more demons attack them because they gain more legal right. And then they're just like, well, uh, Dan Muller just told me to think I'm a son. So all this pressure is building up and it's getting way worse and I'm getting way sicker in the spirit. But I've been taught to just say that I'm already perfected. And that's why those people are really, unfortunately, a lot of them, they're really having like this, this iceberg just expanding more and more. And they're just seeing what's above the surface. And they hardly even know what's going to hit them if they don't actually um, get this in perspective. Yes, but I, I mean... So God loves everybody in the sense that when you look at the cross, that's available to everybody. Yeah, the I cross mean, is what yeah. exempl the cross exemplifies God's love to everybody. That's his outreach to all people to say, I'm drawing you towards me. Will you kneel at the foot of the cross and worship my son? Mm. Basically, exactly. that's the extension of God's love. This is where you find mercy, but it's also where justice is met. Right. Mm. But the thing is, you can't go there with that kind of like haughty attitude that you are, you just, you basically deserve to be a son. Do you know what I mean? It, that, that is just like, to me, that's like yeah. the, the main part of this heresy. 
that you, like people just waltz in completely unaware that they are totally out of sync with the spirit mm -hmm. and that it really is like a battle it really is a fight to actually like and it's not working out it's not working for your salvation it's working out your salvation with fear and trembling no one is saved until the end no one right. That's right. god knows who's saved but we don't know what what's going on this side of the grave right who you know a, a, eternal security in that sense is like a I mean, you, you can have like a, a, an assurance, I suppose, yeah, yeah. That, that the Lord will finish something he starts. But I tell you what, do you, can you even have that assurance unless you're being chastised? I don't think you can. Not at all. Not at all. But, you know, like the, the, for me, it's like I, I welcome the chastisement because that's God's expression of love to me. You know, what, you know what's ironic is like these, these identity people, I think a lot of them, when they're getting actual, if they are getting actual chastisement from God, I think they would say, oh, that's just a demon from the outside trying to attack me. They don't understand that God does chastise his children, literally. And at the same time, when real Christians get chastised and they understand it's intense, they can ironically shift to a real version of what these identity people do in a fake manner when they're like, thank you that I'm a son. You can literally be like, thank you that I'm actually a son when you're getting chastised because that's the real proof that you're a son. So when they say, oh, thank you that I'm a son and everything, if it's not accompanied by the real evidence, which is chastisement, they can't have that, but we can actually have it. So I think we should take advantage of that. Sure, but there are other signs as well. Like when, if, you, if you're in a position of authority where you can cast out demons in the Lord Jesus Christ's name and you know you're kind of, I guess, uh, as Chris would put it, birthright. Yeah. Uh, to do that kind of thing, right? Like, Jesus didn't say, don't rejoice that the demons come out of people. Rejoice that your name's written in heaven. And, and, and also, like, when people say horrible things about you, when they falsely accuse you, when they do all these things, you know, look up for your redemp redemption. Hey, there, done that, redemption right? draweth nigh, Can't right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, th there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, if God gave, even didn't spare his son, but gave him up for us all, you know, that. let's just stop there, right, you know, at that comma, yeah? If God didn't even spare his son, the perfect person, basically, yeah. the wisest, most intelligent, most creative, cleverest, coolest person who's ever lived, right? Mm -hmm was not spared by the father why because he obviously wants to help us out obviously it was also to have victory over his main enemy the devil the evil one right we're a happy byproduct of that even though we don't deserve it we get a second shot right but he didn't give up his son that's amazing he chastised his son in that sense who didn't deserve any? He wasn't a criminal. He wasn't. He didn't. Yeah, do anything his son became wrong. an offering for sin. That's super intense. When you really think about it, it's like, wow, he didn't deserve that at right. all. He's the like basically the only right. one who walked. You and know, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, that right. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is like, even though I've been talking about this, you know, I told everybody I'm going to be crucified. But if there's any way, other way to do it, let's just do that way. Yeah. And, and that mean, that's was hard. Right? Him, it, that was definitely in a sense where it's like, you know, he's completely just sold out to his father. Like, you know what? Anyway, you want to do it. But he's just, he showed that it's okay to be honest about how you're feeling while still being submitted to the most high God and just be like, look. And not I'm being unrighteous in it. Do. Exactly. I mean, he wasn't unrighteous when he said, it wasn't like doubt. He was just saying, "Is there any other way to do this, really? Because this is like this is brutal. This is hard. Yeah. You know, you've got to. I mean, there is no one more obedient. There is no one like a, a cooler than a cucumber in the face of death than yeah. Jesus Christ. There is no one right, and still sweating blood. Uh, you know, because of the the 
what he knew he had to go through. Yeah. You know, the, the plea to the father, you know, is there any other way? And the father did it that way through him, even though, you know, the, the, the perfect, perfect spotless lamb, you know, basically sacrificed on our behalf. But why do we that, if the master is treated like that, how should the servants be treated? Do you see what I mean? Exactly. Who deserve exactly. it? We all deserve damnation. He didn't. We are you know still walking his sufferings. And I've heard uh, the person who runs the Dan Muller non-official channel, he said in one comment to Chris, like we have to um, basically pick up where he left off. But the truth is where you can't void walking in the sufferings. You can't void that. And that's what that person was right. trying to do by that comment. They're just completely wrong. No, there, I think there's a verse that actually says the fellowship of his sufferings. Yeah, yeah. So we actually we don't we don't we don't like evolve past his sufferings. We we involve ourselves. Yeah, he he basically yeah. says, pick up your own cross mm -hmm. and follow me. Exactly. We walk as we ought to walk. We ought to walk as he walked, and that's what it says in Sean too. In other words, stop putting burden on me and start helping other people people by taking their burdens and help me out with yeah. your own cross and i will empower you do you see what i mean that's right it's very serious but the, the other thing is that pharisee spirit like it's so ironic that these people accuse us of it because it, it's them yeah. that's the log in the eye it's total hypocrisy the people who are basically calling us out for wanting to obey the lord and you know work out our salvation with fear and trembling however you interpret that i mean obviously i believe we interpret it the right way because i'll tell you what i'll tell you why we interpret it the right way because after all is said and done any works that we do that have any value the lord jesus christ gets the credit and at the end of the day when we're standing before the Lord, I'm not going to say, Lord, I did this and this and this for you. You'd owe me one. I'm going to say, have mercy on me, a wretched sinner. Exactly. You know, like I, I definitely exactly. haven't done it all right all the time. Even when you've been telling me to do stuff, I've ignored you, blah, blah, blah. Right. And also, I tell you what, there's another scripture that says, uh, I have to paraphrase it, but it's it's almost like, uh, we just did our duty. We were just servants. Oh, I love it. That's in Luke. Yeah, that's a really good verse. Yeah. So, on uh, so, yeah, and so like when we actually get to that point, and the Lord, we're being judged by the Lord along with everybody else, right? Because everybody gets judged at the end of, at the Great White Throne. That's my opinion. Yes, Absolutely. we're judged. At the, I, everyone's going to be judged. I completely agree with that. Yeah, but people say that we're judged at the cross, and there is a truth in that. But the thing is, you're judged at the cross at the great white throne judgment, yeah, because that's the be... only thing that's going to save you. That's yeah. the point, right? That just because you're obedient to the Lord or whatever, that's just He gets the credit for that. The yeah. only thing that saves us is the cross, right? But the point is, when we get to that point, he, we, all we're going to say is we were just servants. We were just doing our duty. It's not like yeah. we get credit for it. Exactly. In fact, it's our honor to serve him. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm not expecting any, but the Lord is so gracious that he will actually give us rewards uh, yeah, exactly. for obeying him. I mean, that's the mercy that's and awesome. grace of God, right? That's awesome, man. So think, that's the point, right? I, I, I think that really, that really sums up a lot of it, man. And, for any, you know, for just anyone watching this, like you've got to really look at your, just the practical application part. You've really got to look at your everyday life and be like, am I taking my sin as seriously as God is taking my sin? Do I have his, his lens? Because some people say he only sees Christ in us, but in terms of justification, if you're walking in repentance, yeah, we're in justification and our faith is imputed as righteousness, but are we seeing our sin the way God sees? He's still looking at your sin. So are you seeing it the way God sees it? Are you reading Revelation 2 and 3 and seeing how Jesus Christ, his son, speaks to the churches? Are you seeing the way that he addresses sin? He doesn't address it like, you're good. You're a son. He's like, you're my son, so I'm going to address your sin. 
So guys, the, the main thing I want to put here is, are you seeing it that way? Is that your lens? And are you address step two? Are you addressing it appropriately? Are you repenting with a repentant heart, with a broken and contrite heart? Because God won't despise that, yet he will despise anything contrary to that. Exactly. But I would say, I know I kind of know what they're going to say now. They're going to say, well, we, we are... Uh, we are made righteous by faith mm -hmm. which is true so that was, that, that'll be the, that is true yeah um so that 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 would be the first point yeah and the second point is um what was it now i've forgotten but anyway let's just go with that first one yeah. so oh so basically um the lord tells us at any given point examine yourself like on a daily basis examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith mm -hmm. Take that was the point. Paul is also in because that one's in Second Corinthians, and then in First Corinthians ten, he says, "Take heed lest you fall." In First Corinthians, right? 10, oh, yeah, and pride comes before a fall as hey, well. So, the, so cool. the other the other thing is, if you were if you really are deluded and you're in pride and you think you're you're better than you really actually are, and more important than you actually are, you are going to fall. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, like there's a, I, I don't know where it is. Maybe Jesus says it. He, there's like a parable that basically says, look, the people who are like coveting like the best places at the banquet. Oh yeah. Those people might, those people might be moved to a more humble position. You're going to yeah. be embarrassed, right? The but the who people are who are just going the for the lowest bit. Friend, move up. <laughs> when exactly. Look, have place this place of honor. Don't sit here. I want you to sit at the head. Exactly. And then you're honored, right? exactly there's another there's another verse i love that parable says, man guys honestly apply that to your life always take the most humility possible because you got nowhere to go but up well i'll tell, I tell you what i'll tell you what actually there was a pagan guy i knew in new zealand uh he was a he was an american and he was a a very interesting person in many ways and uh completely demonized like uh, yeah. even then i knew he was completely like gone but he said something that has always stuck with me and it is that it was definitely like whether he took it from the bible or something but like his ethos like we were all planning like some kind of psychedelic trance party right oh, sure. and uh, and what happened was we were all kind of like allotted jobs to do to kind of like set this thing up right okay. And and basically, like, he was seen as kind of like the older, wiser kind of like of the group, I guess. And so technically speaking, he could have taken like whatever the best job was. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, so we were all discussing what jobs we were going to do. And he said, whatever the other, whatever the job is that no one else wants to do, I'll do that one. And I'll tell you what, that stuck with me. With the that unbelievers, really there's, with there's a law in their heart that's a law unto themselves, like in Romans 2. It's like they know what the truth yeah. is, the conscience excuses them when they do right. So that, that really is very impactful. Yeah. And TJ, if by some miracle you're actually watching this, I pray for you. I love you. You are an amazing person in many ways, but you're a complete reprobate and you need to repent. And also you really inspired me in many ways and i really really hope you find the lord jesus christ because you'll love him trust me you will love the lord he is amazing trust me amen i could speak to um being in a ton of bad stuff before i was saved being kind of like oh. a life of the party type person always oh, being dude. down to do a ton of stuff and there there is a kind of like there's a good version of that you can get when you're in christ where it's like instead of just being down to like kind of be entertaining for people and like be willing to go through certain things with them and do stuff with them that they consider fun, you get, a, you get like a warrior mentality. You're willing to go through the trenches. You're willing to go to a ministry where you know you're going to get attacked by a ton of people, even though you're doing the right thing. You're willing to undergo a calling where demons will attack you a lot. You're willing to get metaphorically spit on by people who were your family, people who used to look up to you, even like for guidance. Go through, I go through, I've been through that. I've been through it. And sure. that's the thing, like you need to go through it though. It makes you way stronger and it's a it blessing. Does. You see everything is a blessing in time. God makes everything beautiful, man. 
even, like even Joseph being beaten and almost killed by his brothers, he made beautiful. So he's going to be able to do it for whatever you're going through. As Everything long as the body works out for those who love God. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the best scripture for that. I mean, that, that's the thing. Like, it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you really, really do love God, he'll work it out for your best. You know, it doesn't, it, it could be completely rubbish. Like my friends in Africa right now. Mm -hmm in kenya they are really really suffering but i tell you what they all really really love jehovah they love him yeah. and he'll work it out for their best you That's know right. and th all they've got is their faith all they've got is their faith but at the end of the day they they will it will be worth it mm -hmm. it's like Ro it's that romans 8 passage it doesn't matter what we suffer in this life it doesn't matter in fact that's going to be the crown that you will wear on the other side that's what i think of it's like you gotta just get like do what you gotta do to get those rewards later and be willing to go through it when when you're going through that just think of it like god wants you to have more in the next life but the rewards aren't don't come from something that you make up for yourself the mm -hmm. rewards come from actually just being obedient to what he wants you to do letting god work through you like he works yeah. in those in you for his good pleasure like philippians 2 13 says we got to be open to that we got to be an open vessel to him working through us and then there you go but then there's no effort really when he's actually truly asking you to do something and you're truly abiding in him there really isn't an effort to it it might suck in terms of like physical discomfort or something but there's no effort in terms like it's an enjoyable process because you know I, you're doing what he wants right i really agree so there's in in that way there's not the striving that that they accuse us of the pharisees i mean yeah because they because they twist strive to enter the narrow gate that that's basically like when jesus was staying obedient even to death on a cross but he had all like all the power from the holy spirit he would have ever needed to go through that and i think that a lot of people who have not actually been born from above yet they are doing everything in their flesh they can't really do any genuine good works. And they're like, oh, this is tough. This is strenuous. How, like, how could you possibly say we have to like obey God and stuff? When people get born again, they understand that it's, it's genuinely from the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you're able to do it. Right. And there's a proverb that I like as well that always stuck with me. I'll paraphrase it. It's not exactly how it is, but it's something like godly people truly understand justice but evil people have no idea what it means, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think, that, like, if you're truly godly, uh, the only way you can be godly is to literally have God's spirit in you and yeah. be obedient to him, right? That's, That's what a godly person is. It, it, there's no other way. You have, to, you have to actually know him and abide in him to be godly because you're not godly in your own right or your own strength, right? So godly people understand justice. Why? Because he reveals it to you. He shows you, look, justice is met at the cross. I mean, the cross is a brutal execution device. Like there is no more brutal execution. They even invented a word for the pain someone experiences at the cross, excruciating. Whenever you use that word excruciating, you're exemplifying the extremity of the pain that yeah. one would feel being crucified. That's what that. it means. I've never thought about that before. That's really interesting. Yeah, cruce. That's where yeah. that word comes from, excruciating. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that, that you know, that, that there was a special word for someone being crucified that we now use in our, you know, modern vernacular, you know, yeah. to exp express like this, like horrendous pain that you're feeling, right? And basically we are asked to take that upon ourselves to pick up our own cross is to take on this excruciating experience of some kind oh. against the the tide of the world and the way they do things and if you're truly truly being obedient I, I you know there's not a day that goes past and i don't say this in a suicidal or depressive way i am i have all the joy and i love being here can't wait to get out of here love you all want to go home done with it every everything's gone nothing's fun anymore 
it doesn't matter. Like all the things I used to call fun are just not fun yeah. anymore. Right. There's just You're no, nice. I like, know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, and, and not only that, like everybody else who's having fun is like debauchery to me. Exactly. It's like, it, it, I, I feel God's like disappointment or, or like even wrath against okay, it. Sometimes. Disgust for sure. Definitely disgust. And, 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 and so like, everything that most people would call fun going to the movies going to have like a strong drink in a pub and, and have a bunch of like i don't know whatever they do there or like going to a party and getting hammered on drugs or something or what else is fun i don't even know R racing around a, a track in a race car or something the the need for speed that kind of thing it's just like none of that's fun guys it's almost like, like this is a fight for our lives mm -hmm. It's almost like when you really know Christ, you see the end in sight of all those things. And you're like, oh, those things are going to come to an end. Like that's going to be, it's going to be over. And then you're going to be like, well, that's done now. It's, you see, everything is so temporary. And that's, that's the thing, man. Like when you see that, it just humbles you. Like the just, fragility of life. Exactly. So the French, the French call uh, the orgasm, they call it le petit mort which means the little death, right? So that right is at really the, cynical, man. <laughs> it's very cynical, but that's what the French call the orgasm. That's wow. literally what they call it, right? But it's very interesting, and there's actually a lot of wisdom in it. Why? Because right at that moment, that pinnacle, that climax, it's the best thing ever. Straight after it, it's gone. That's it. That's the end. Then what, what happens is, especially if you've filled with spirit of lust or something, yeah, yeah, you just have to keep repeating it in order to get your hit. Right. It's, Which it's, is why it's, pornography is so addictive. Right. Interesting, like, oh. But, the, but the link I'm trying to, the link I'm trying to make here is everything of the flesh is temporary and has an end. That's what I'm trying to say. That, 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 as wonderful and as, as, as strong as that feeling is of orgasm, right? It ends. There's an end to it that cannot be like perpetually continued, right? Yet, what Jesus Christ is offering us, and I've had a taste of it, I've got a glimpse of what eternal life is, is if you remain in obedience and abide in Him, He offers you that perpetual experience of heaven let's call it heaven right that that everybody's looking for he created the orgasm but he also created the end right whereas he's basically saying to be in my presence is basically to be with the most high he the most high you could ever get is to be with the most high right and so everybody's like temporarily going with the, the the temporal fixes whatever that might be mm -hmm. the race card thing the having sex the i don't know uh going to parties all this stuff it all comes being, to an end you know, being cool you know having right. your soda all that and that but the, the thing is all of us at the end of the day and this is where the kind of cynical depression kind of wisdom comes in of ecclesiastes is at the end of the day you are going to be on your deathbed sick probably no. basically like taking those last breaths thinking was it worth it was it worth it you know what i mean yeah you really because we're all going to be there the way that we got to think of it is like i mean lord willing we even get to that age i'll, I'll clarify that but it's like you just want to be like i love you lord thank you for getting me through this and i just pray that you know I just pray that in, even in these last moments, my heart just remains obedient to you. And I just love you. Me and too. For getting me Please through. Lord, yeah. Really, I mean, that really for a real Christian, the, the longer you live, the more close you get to death, the more happy you should be. But you notice for people who are still in the world, spiritually speaking, they are getting more sad the more time goes on. Once people hit like, I don't know. Once they hit like their fifties, if they're not born again, they're just like, okay, I'm starting to get older. All over. They're like, I'm yeah. starting to get older now. What do I do? Right. I'm going to try to be young a little bit, you know? And, and that's the, the problem is they're looking for it in the wrong places. But if they had God, they would, they'd be like, I'm getting closer to being with God forever. 
I'm getting wrinkly and stuff. That's cool. I'm yeah. ready for eternity. Okay, <laughs> like, I'm ready for something way better than this. But I mean, so for me, the whole Christian walk is walking towards one moment. I'm listening. taking that last breath. That last breath is the crucial moment. Everything relies on that. Yeah. Are you because basically, look, a lot of those kind of like uh, tr the truth is of like five years ago or whatever. Uh, you, they were always talking about Satan and then Lucifer. Lucifer being the false light. Blah blah blah. That you know. You know what I mean? I don't know if you watched a lot of that kind of stuff, but basically, a lot of the kind of Illuminati crowd will talk oh, about watched, Lucifer. That stuff. Right. So that so the point is like there he is a, he, he comes as an angel of light. Amen. to deceive who he might devour right so the thing is there is a real light and there is a false light mm -hmm. and the thing is i've seen um whether you believe them or not like uh, near-death experiences or even people who have gone to heaven or hell like whether they have or not i don't know but yeah. what, I, the, what their testimonies are fairly similar in the sense that those who kind of went to hell a lot of the time like a, a, a large proportion of them were immediately like lulled in with like this whole false idea of what heaven would be and they you know the ton of, of light that people talk about and stuff the false light the false light mm -hmm. and it, it, if anyone's ever heard of howard Pittman, have you heard of his testimony that. dude as soon as you get off this call look at the howard Pittman testimony it's amazing but yeah, he was just, he was almost deceived by that false light. It's a really, really good testimony. Trust me. Um, really, really worth watching. But yeah, I mean, the Bible says Satan comes to us as, a, as an angel of light. And that has multiple applications. But it also applies to in this like last breath scenario. Because if you're not abiding in the Lord, you will go towards that false light and not the real one. It's interesting, man, because... I did a video on Facebook a little while back and I was basically saying like the really scary thing about deception is that if in your heart you want to be deceived, you'll get deceived. Like if you are willing to step into it, it will really have a legal right to, to hard step into your life and, and take you over. And that's the well, thing. I mean, the Lord literally says he hands people over to the delusion. Exactly. The strong delusion. Exactly. Well, people want that delusion. I've literally heard Lady Gaga obviously a complete satanist whatever but yeah, she's literally, totally not she literally said, i would rather have a large dose of bs than the truth so obviously she understands what the truth is but she would rather have the bs she right probably knows but the that's truth just and everything bro right but that's just the extremity of what most people probably believe like she at least she's got the ghoul, ghoul to say it you yeah. know what i mean and this is what I say often on Facebook. Like, listen, if you really do want to follow the devil, just be honest. Mm -hmm. Make the most of it. Please. You know what I mean? Why Why do you give Jesus lip service and not follow him? I don't get it. I, I don't understand. What are you hoping to achieve here? He's going to spit the lukewarm out of his mouth. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Not hot, not cold. You're just doing both. Well, Pharisees. You know what's so interesting? Like, I remember even before I was born again, there was this one uh, woman who I was friends with, and she would make some of the most, like, emphatic posts about Jesus on her on her Facebook. And I'm not saying right. she's, like, the worst sinner ever or something, but, like, you know, obviously, like, we were all, like, in willful sin and stuff. And she was from, like, another, you know, university. But, you know, we were both doing stuff that weren't – that wasn't right. And, right. and like, I, but I would see these posts and they just, if, if you didn't really like have discernment, you'd be like, oh, this is a person who really loves the Lord. But it's scary. Like the, the thing about being lukewarm is like, it's not just always being like, oh, whatever, maybe I'll, you know, sin now and oh, maybe I'll follow God. It's like an intense of both. Like, they say you're not hot or cold. It's almost like you're a false version of being both hot and cold. And now you're just walking in like, you'll go intense into sin, 
but then you'll be in a situation where you feel like you got to praise God so much more just to kind of make up for what was going on. And, and I don't know if that was exactly the case with her, but it's scary, man. When you see people really, they feel like they, I mean, I just really don't even know if a lot of these people know what they're doing. Do you, do you know the word hypocrite? Uh, do you know where it comes from? I, I know that that word at its root in Greek is like a play actor or a pretender rather right, than someone the, who just says one thing and does another. It's like a, it's like the, a act you take but, off. So, so the way we use it now comes directly from Jesus Christ. He was the first person to coin actor, which is what hypocrite means, yeah. as the two-faced Pharisee that says one thing and does another. Mm. He was the first person to use it in that context. That's why it means what it does now. Wow, so Jesus cool. invented that. That's Jesus, it. I mean, he is the word, but he invented that meaning of hypocrite, right? Yeah. So when he says hypocrites, vipers, he's actually saying actors. You're acting. Yeah. You Absolutely. are not. Absolutely. Uh, but that, so that reigns it back into the Pharisee spirit as well. They're yeah. actors. There's no genuinity. Like they don't understand that God knows everything about them, everything. The, the hidden things they're doing in the darkness that will all come to light, that will be shouted from the rooftops. Things they're looking they forward just really forward. don't think that's going to happen, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just to quickly interject, like the things they're looking forward to that are wrong, that they're premeditatively planning. He's like, I see it. I see what's going on there. Yeah. Well, they think they're probably going to get congratulated for a lot of it. Whereas that, what, what's actually going to happen is their words will damn them. Yeah. Because the Lord says that as well. Your words will damn you. And you know what's interesting about that? Because that links into the end of John 12 where Jesus says, my word will judge you in the last day. But he also, of course, says, by your words you'll be justified or condemned, I think, in Matthew. I know it's in the Gospels, though. Um, a lot of people, they preach like this false love and they say they're very gracious. They say they show a lot of love. But the people, a lot of the people who do that they condemn a lot of the time. So when other people don't show love, in their opinion, they don't show love. So all those people are going to be condemned if they don't repent because they're not like, let me give you an example. Like, let's say someone they like, like Dan Muller gets attacked. And then they say, you're not showing the love. You need to repent. You're, a, you're doing this. You're doing that. They're now going to be condemned for their words because they're not showing grace and love to me. They'll show a false version of it sometimes, but you know, ultimately it's not coming from a real place. And every time that they're, you know, saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to show grace and love and they don't do it. That's them being condemned by their own words, unfortunately. For them. So there's, there's two things I want to say to that. If I can, if I can remember them both. The first thing is that, so going to easy believism for just for a second, okay. right? What I don't understand about it. So like, obviously the identity teachers will teach that, you only have to believe in Jesus, believe your son and you're saved, right? That's the essence, is it not? Is that fair? So what I don't understand is they will, people will look at us, call us work salvationists and condemn us for that, for wanting to obey, wanting to do what we believe the Lord is doing. Right? They'll call us. God's going to be like, oh, you wanted to do my will, but this person who did nothing's righteous. Yeah, but it, it, it's more than that. It's like, well, look, we also believe in Jesus. Just because we want to obey him, why does that nullify our belief in Jesus? Why, why can you work works of unrighteousness and believe in Jesus, and we work what we believe he's actually asking us to do, obey him and, for, you know, get rid of sin and whatever, and, and believe in Jesus. Why are we both, why then are you saved just because it's only faith alone and that's it, and we are not? People who know that revelation are oftentimes a lot older. Um, they're often past, like, even, like, like, I don't see anyone, like, really even in, like, their 20s and 30s who understand that most of the time. It's usually people who are older Christians who realized that that type of thing it, it really is and i didn't even really think of it that way until right now it's like if you really do believe there's a there's a different level of grace and mercy you're going to show to people because you understand that if someone's really sold out to god even if they're not you know 
looking exactly how you think they should look, you're going to have that extra mercy on them and be willing to still love them as long as they believe the essentials. But you see a lot of people, they don't do that because they don't understand it. Uh, So obviously, you know, our pastor is Chris LaSala, right? And so like going to him and and the way he gets attacked by people, right? I would say like he gets condemned by those people more than anyone else, to be fair. Wouldn't you say? A lot of them, the people who say all yeah. types of sin will be allowed into heaven are the people that attack him. Right. But it's, uh, what I find so ironic is they will defend some like Satanist who just believes in, in faith alone and that's it. They've just come to the Lord or whatever. They're okay. They're Whereas right. someone who's actually like, so uh, it's so interesting, uh, 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 like someone like Sam Shamoon who calls him a devil yeah. doing the works of the devil. Uh, hang on a minute. By your own admission, he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore he is going to be saved no well no just because he beat you in a debate and just because you know like he absolutely destroyed him in that debate but also but also like you know he he was he's so full of pride that you know just because he can't like articulate the trinity to persuade us that that's the reality now we are children of the devil it's like, um, I just don't, I, it, it's inconsistent. It's inconsistent. All of us, regardless of anything else, you, me, Chris, everybody else at BDS, truly, truly, truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to the Father and that we have no hope in our own works. Mm-hmm. Right? Amen. That's true, is it not? Absolutely it is. We believe he's the divine, only begotten son of God, right? Pre-existent. That's right. Now what? Got to believe now in what? pre-existence. It's now what? Now what, though? Now, so wh- why are we now condemned as heretics? I don't understand. I don't, what, what do you mean we're work salvationists? Why does that nullify us from salvation, then, according to your own doctrine? That's my point. You see what I'm trying? It's so hypocritical, right? I like that point. Well, there it is, man. I think I think we've really gotten through a ton here, and I pray that it's edifying to the body of Christ and for people who see it, who just haven't, haven't figured it out yet. Um, I really do hope that it affects you positively and that you really let it resonate in you and that it produces some good fruit. Um, it, yeah, yeah, I knew that this was going to be good, and it was, so... I praise God for it. Cool. And thank you so much for being here, bro. Thank you. And can I just say that we haven't got it all sussed. We both, are we not, trying to still work this out with fear and trembling, right? That's the point. Like, uh, we, this once saved, always saved attitude. Like, we're not sat here, like, basically lecturing everybody to, t- to, to, to basically, like, twist their arm to understand like we do. This is how we understand. We know it's the truth. We know that identity teachers like Moller and White and and Cabrera are teaching things that are going to land you in hot water. That's why we're coming against it. This is stupid. It's not in the Bible. It's just not not there. You can't find it. You can twist scriptures to find it. But at the end of the day, we have to endure to the end to be saved we have to like receive chastisement if we want to be considered sons i don't see any of those people who call themselves sons who are standing on a podium being chastised or if they are being chastised they don't admit it yeah and then they're not so then they're i'll not tell you what i i've been watching todd white recently just like watching how he is and i'll tell you what that man is not happy he is not living the life that he easy thinks to see he's projecting. That he's not doing well it's easy to see todd white has this kind of fake um you know situation going on with with his demeanor especially he's, he's living a double life yeah he's not happy he's not and it's not to do with persecution from people like us it's not that it's a spiritual disconnection in my opinion he is now walking in the flesh he's rejected the chastisement of god and he's also rejecting the rebukes of the church like his brothers yeah if we can call him a brother right like so many people have tried to reach out to him so many people 
you know, and he's just, he's a superstar now. But what that means is, you know, he's got to keep his stupid haircut. He's got to, I don't know, he's just got to do everything that he thinks people want to see. Like, you know, I, I, I don't even understand really why anyone would have that persona except to be marketable, honestly. Right. That's Right, exactly, and that, but you know, like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, maybe it's not the time to say it now because it might say start a whole new fire. But like, one of the things as as a British person that I've told you about before, yeah, is there's something about most Americans that the rest of the world sees that Americans don't see about themselves, which is this real disingenuousness. Yeah. And I can we all see this like falseness. Everybody, every you ask any European, you ask anyone from Australia, you ask anyone from India, you ask anyone from Africa, and well, maybe not Africa actually. I'll tell you why is because Africans are really susceptible to that prosperity gospel, and obviously the identity gospel yeah. is the two point zero prosperity gospel, right? But I tell you what, like most of the world sees this fakeness that goes on in the United States, you know? Uh, I don't know what it is. It must be a principality behind it, I think. It has to be. I totally agree with that. But, you know, when, when Americans are being real, they are the best people in the world. But so often, like, people get burned, like, who are foreigners, like, whether it's traveling abroad or, like, just they come to our country or we go to your country... It, there's always that like doubt whether that person really is being disingenuous or not but it's it seems to be like um heightened like the, the whole thing is like like comes to a climax with these american preachers is there anyone more disingenuous than kenneth copeland than i don't know stephen anderson than I don't know, like you, you name it. People like name him. an American preacher. I'll, I'll say they're disingenuous. John MacArthur. Yeah. I think he's a disingenuous dude. I literally get the creeps listening to him. I don't know if it's... I, mean, I, 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 I Don't get me wrong. I hope and pray for all of these people. And you cannot claim that, that Jesus is Lord without the Spirit. You just can't do it. Yeah. But the problem is these people have built their own kingdoms and that's more important to them. MacArthur's got a lot of money, bro. Rick Warren has a lot of money. And you know, all these people... The love of money. Uh, you, know, you know what all these, so many of these people have done? Francis Chan, John MacArthur, John Piper. They've let Rick Warren into their circle, and they've, I've heard them all affirm that he's a Christian. And that right. absolutely could not be further from the truth. Rick Warren is a devil. Um, the thing I don't is, know anything that, about him. What? I know who he is, but I don't know anything about oh, yeah. him. Really. He, he basically, um, he wrote one book that got super famous and it was extremely easy believism, basically. And he's so the all, it's the all purpose driven life, right? Yeah, it's, it's that one. I haven't read it, but I've, I've heard of it. Yeah. He's also like hard yoked with the Vatican. Like he's very ecumenical too. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a bad sign. You judge a tree like, by its fruit, right? And now what, now that Francis Chan is basically saying, I'm not going to get too much into this, but like, mighty, but, but like, now that he's with him, he's like, oh, you know, now he's okay with Catholics and stuff. But it's like, man, once you, and this is a Pharisee thing too. No, this is a Pharisee thing too. When they want to be loved by men, Rick Warren is the perfect example of wanting to be loved by men um, in Saddleback Church. You get all these people who, by the way, got their own kingdoms. John MacArthur certainly has his own kingdom. A lot of money going on. Um, right. And, and you get the same thing from, from Francis Chan, John Piper. They've got their own kingdoms. And that's the thing. And they're unapologetically just yoking with this guy. They're not going through this like process where they're like, I really have to evaluate this. There are serious red flags. They're like, no, I love the world and I want to be popular. And I am going to side with this popular pastor. And that's the thing. If you want to be given over to being a friend of the world, the world will gladly take you. But this is another, I say, maybe this is where the Lord brought it to the pinnacle of the conversation. That you say it's over and the Lord says 20 more minutes. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I th it might not be because this might be the the the, the drop the mic moment. That is the uh, the the height of Phariseeism is to build your own kingdom, claim that you are righteous and no one else is. You have to follow it my way, or it's the highway. And like anyone outside of us is not part of us and everybody else is a heretic. You have to be a and, reformed theologian that believes that man is completely incapable of responding to God. And it's like, <laughs> John Calvin believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary and he held some things about baptism that all you guys would throw him out of the church for, yet you call yourselves Calvinists. Shame on you. That's, that's absolutely hypocritical. Right. I mean, you, but they the thing is, guys believe Tristan. They don't know what these guys believe. They don't know what Calvin and Luther believe. They'd call them damnable heretics if they did. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I don't know anything about those guys too much, except that um, there was a whole bunch of uh, darkness going on in those times that I think we've had. Uh, just on a, on a global scale enlightened to us now yeah. like surely as the the end times have come knowledge has increased everybody's rushing about to and fro like it says in daniel right but the thing is like the lord has also done a whole bunch of new stuff with the church and fresh revelation mm -hmm. and the freshest revelation for the church i think is the revelations we have about demons and the way they attack us that's the them. best I, I really the, and they and those guys didn't know it you know what i mean they yeah. didn't have that you've got to understand they were in their time and to build your church on their doctrines is silly because whilst they have a lot to offer the lord is doing something new uh what well, there's nothing new under the sun obviously but he's doing something new with like the people who are in step and abiding in his spirit and this, for me, like, and, and I'll say it again, true revival comes when you truly understand that you have parasitical spiritual beings tempting you from within the flesh. Inside of you, literally. That's why it's in your mind. Literally in it's your flesh. That's come from the heart. Now, right. That, that need to be delivered you need to be delivered and the deliverance comes when you walk you submit to god and you resist the devil and then he'll flee if you don't submit to him he's not going to flee what's the the submission it's basically ad, the admission of the tax collector it's not lifting your eyes to heaven and, and saying you're worthy of anything the opposite is true. You are not worthy of anything. I'm not worthy of anything. No one's worthy of anything. Yeah. Right? And those people go home right with God. That's what it says. And God can work with that person because you're malleable. There's a very there's a hardness to someone who just is so assured that I'm absolutely saved and there's nothing that God can... There's a hardness to that. I can't go to hell even if I go back to my sin. And when the people say, oh, but I'm not going to go back to my sin or I will repent, it's like, dude, you got to understand that there's a reason why the devil tempts people, bro. It's because they can. Right. So take heed lest you fall. Not you can't fall because you've been saved before. But, but the other thing is, if it's not on a daily basis, it's a still a regular basis. All of us offend God in some way. He just doesn't tell us because we'd probably be destroyed right yeah, he doesn't tell it, it, that's why he chastises those he loves he tells the people who actually want to know when do i offend you lord have i offended you today oh rats i did that okay i'm really sorry you know what i mean that is the continual walking in step with the spirit he shows you what's evil about you not what's holy about you None of us have holiness in us except what he puts in us, right? right? He shows us what's what's evil about us, not the opposite. That's totally true, man. 